God is so good. I thank Him for another time and another opportunity. Um, I pray that you will have a wonderful day. Amen. 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 I think for me, anybody who's ever been in the military, you know, we, uh, this is a day that we, uh, we honor those who have given their lives in the service uh, of our country. Um, I know when I was in the military, uh, it, uh, it taught me a lot about life, it taught me a lot about uh, how I am to live, and I thank God that uh, not only did I receive from my mama how to make my bed? Not <laughs> the Sam showed me too. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah. it's been a blessing, God. It's really Amen. you know blessing us and uh, continuing to uh, see into our lives and into your life, mm -hmm. so that you'll be able to really become that strong, honor warrior. That he's calling you to be. Amen. See, the Bible says that you are already more than a conqueror. That means that as a warrior, you have already been given every tool, every weapon you need to defeat the enemy. Amen. Amen. Every one. There should never be a time when you are defeated by the devil. Now, does that mean you're not going to get tricked? You're not going to fall? No, it doesn't mean that. So we have a lot of battles. I've been, I've, I've, I've been in some fights before, and I cannot say I won every one of them. Amen. <laughs> but I was never defeated. That's right. I may have lost a skirmish, but I'm still here. So that means I've won the war. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. That's what God is expecting of each of you. So we're going to continue in our vein with dealing with salvation. Yes. And again, I want you to understand that uh, just because. Uh, you say you're saved is more a lot more to being saved uh, than just receiving God. There's a lot that you need to do. Salvation is a ongoing process. It doesn't happen just one time. People think, well, you know, I got saved now. I'm all right. I'm, I'm good. I'm on my way. Man, let me tell you something. You got a life you still got to live. Amen. 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 Every single day. You got to walk. You've got to walk every single day day. Every day, don't think that the enemy is not going to try to do everything within his power to dissuade you from walking a pathway of righteousness. Say it. Amen. Because his whole job is to turn you around. Yep. To defeat you in every possible situation and circumstance that you find yourself in. Mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer that the Bible says that greater is he where? That's in, in me. That's in me. Then who? He lives in the, he lives in the in world. world. Yeah. So that means I'm already one of them. Amen. 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 So we deal with salvation. Part two. Russell's Dictionary describes salvation as deliverance from the power and the effect of sin. So the only way to really understand about why we need salvation, we have to go back to the beginning. Got to go back to Adam and Eve and their fall. You got to study how sin first entered into the world and the results of being disobedient to God. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask what they call a rhetorical question because I do not want you to answer to me. I don't want to see no hands raised. I don't, I'm going to close my eyes. So if you bob your head, I have to case. <laughs> has anybody ever been disobedient to God? <laughs> okay. I didn't see you, so I'm Because <laughs> I'm going to be truthful. I have. I have. I have. And that's not a good thing. Because you pay the price for being disobedient to God. God's going to tell you something. God's going to show you a way. God's going to give you everything that you need in order to survive. And when you don't do what he tells you to do, then you are on your own. Mm. People say, well, you know, God did this to me. And, no, God didn't do anything to you. He let you fall prey to your own devices. That's right. Follow your own way of thinking and doing. 
and you got to pay the consequences because my Bible tells me that whatsoever a man what? So, so. That shall he also reap. We uh, yeah. put up a wonderful fence in the back. I think I called Michelle Friday, Thursday. <clears throat> Can't remember what day. I always call her when I'm leaving work. Friday. So I don't know how it was Friday. So Michelle, I'm on my way home. You know, we we do. We talk to each other all the time, so we know each other. But and she said, "Well, I want you to, you know, I realized something that uh, part of your fence came down in the back. You just put this fence up." So I got home and she said, I just didn't want you to be surprised. So when I went back there, it didn't fall down. Somebody kicked it down. Somebody kicked in my fence. And I'm like, hmm. And first thing that came up, well, are you mad? I'm not mad. What you gonna do about it? You gonna go, I'm not gonna look for anybody. I'm not gonna do anything. I have no clue who did it. I don't know why they did it. That is inconsequential. That means nothing. All I know is, is God's going to take care of it, get it put, put back up, be reinforced, whatever. My thing is, whoever did it, you're going to have to pay the consequences exactly. of what? Yeah. And the seeds that you sow, the harvest you're going to get is far more worse than anything I could even think about doing to you. Amen. Right? That is true. So I let God now take that's care true. of the situation. That's yeah. what we have to understand and realize. Mm -hmm. That whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Mm. So Genesis, the second chapter, verse 9. Says and, it not, go ahead. and out of the ground, the Lord, Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of not the knowledge of good and evil. God placed two distinct trees in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I have my own, I don't want to say theory, but my own opinion, that's the word, that of these two trees, if they had been obedient to do everything God had said to do, they would have been able to really enjoy everything that God had for them. Yeah. But they didn't. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, what part of you shall surely die didn't they understand? Mm. We probably didn't understand any of it because death had not entered into the world as of yet. But it doesn't matter what they thought the whole concept was being obedient. Yeah. We see in these verses that God had given them restrictions mm -hmm. about those two trees. And until that point, nothing had ever been denied to Adam. He was given everything but one thing. And I was listening to uh, one of my favorite ministers this morning. I don't have a lot of televangelists. I only have about two. And one of them was on this morning. And he even touched on this. And I thought it was absolutely wonderful. Because he began to talk about how God did this to let Adam know, I created you. I created you perfect. But what I also want you to know is I'm still in charge. No matter how much you think of yourself and all that you've, I've given you, and how big and bad you are, I'm bigger and bad. Because there's one thing I'm going to tell you, you cannot do. Plain and simple. So many times God gives us instructions, but he doesn't tell us why we are to do them. See, God told him why. Said if you touch it, you're gonna die. But how many, and like I said, I, my, my own my opinion is, is that if he had have done what God said do in time, God would have given him the ability to eat of that tree. Amen. But see, it's just like everything else that we do in our lives. God expects obedience in everything we do. No 
God tells you to do something, he expects you to just follow it. How many times have we told our children to do something? I, 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 I asked ask this question. Every time you tell your child to do something, do you always tell them why you want them to do it? No. I didn't. No, I, no, I'm not saying every time. There's times when I tell them to do yeah. something, this is why I want you to do that. Because they, they're going to give you that quizzing eye as to, you want me to do that? <laughs> you may have to explain some certain yeah. things. But some things you're going to just say do because you want to see just how they're going to do it. Right. Are they going to use their own imaginations? Are they going to stretch themselves? Are they going to be obedient just to do what you said do? And you find that a lot of times people don't want to do that. They don't want to follow your word. And that's what happened to Adam and Eve. We have to learn. We have to learn how to trust God and be obedient to his word. Trusting God is not automatic. I don't care what people think. Trusting God is not an automatic process. You have to learn to trust God. Children of Israel had to learn to trust God. All the followers of Jesus, his disciples, they had to learn to trust Jesus. Jesus had to prove himself by doing certain things and saying certain things and acting in a certain way so that they could follow him because it took them having to learn to trust his word. And many times... He'd do something, and to us, it's like, man, if he'd have done that in front of me, that would have been a problem. <laughs> and you could sit up here and fed 5,000 people with two loaves of, of, of bread, five fish, five, uh, two fish, five loaves of bread. The Bible says the very next day, they're in the boat. Storm comes up. They hollering, screaming, and crying. And Jesus had to turn to them and say, hey, y'all have little faith. In essence, I just got done showing you one of the greatest miracles you're ever going to see in your life. You don't trust me enough to think I'm going to help save you in a boat? What's the problem? But this is how we act. This is how we do it. These are the things that enter into our lives that we have to understand and realize we got to clear out all that baggage. we got to clear out all those cobwebs. we got to destroy all that stinking thinking so that everything we do, you know, we can be obedient to God. And have him pleased with us. That was Adam's responsibility to teach Eve. <clears throat> he had to teach her all about the garden. He had to tell her and teach her what she could do. But most importantly, he had to teach her what she could not do. So Genesis 3, starting in the first verse. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, at least you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took the fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman that you gave to be with me, I like that part, the woman who you gave to be with me gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. 
Sound familiar? You <laughs> did. See, the serpent, who was more so than any beast of the field, began his plan of attack. His plan of attack, I think we talked about it last week, was spirits of lies mm -hmm. and confusion. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what he did. Mm -hmm. well, you shall not surely die. You partially die, right? <laughs> See, when you eat of it, you're going to be like God. You're going to know good and evil. Now, that really wasn't a lie because uh -huh. once they ate, they did know good and evil. Right? Yeah. But they were not supposed to know it at that time. Right. There it is. But here in comes the confusion. Because the enemy will do that to you all the time. Mm -hmm. He'll set traps for you. When you think you're going to do this, he comes around on the back side. What's that movie we saw? They call it, it's called the Kansas City Shuffle. Okay. Yeah, Kansas City Shuffle. Anybody ever heard of the Kansas City yeah, Shuffle? Yeah. You're supposed to look right. Then you look left. When you look left, he's coming around on the right. That's what the enemy wants to do for you. That's what he did to Eve. And in her confusion, she forgot everything that Adam had told her. Because see, God didn't tell Eve, don't he? Right. He told Adam, don't he? And Adam did not do what God had told him to do in being her covering. Right. What did he do? Turn around and threw her under the bus. That woman you gave me. <laughs> <laughs> not a good thing to do. You have to take responsibility for your own actions. Yes. Yeah. That's why you have to come to God for yourself. And that's why you need salvation. Mankind has been separated from God. He's been lost. And he's been trying his best to be reconciled to God. And the only way that can come is by the shedding of blood. That's why it has to be redemption. And the only redemption that came was through Jesus Christ. We need that. So we have to take a look at sin. And again, people, well, you know, hey, I'm, I'm already saved. Well, I understand that too. And I'm going to close my eyes again. Anybody sinned yesterday? Anybody sinned the day before, any time this past week? I ain't sinned. You don't have to show it. I know I thought some bad thoughts. I know I probably said some words that weren't right. I had to always go to God and say, Father, forgive me for my unrighteousness. Yeah. Oh, but you're a pastor. Yeah, I'm a man, too. That's right. I'm a human being, too. That's right. And any time that it's like the Bible says, if I say I have not sinned, then I'm a liar, and the truth is not in me. you got to face this. That's right. Yes. Yeah. I'm not going to be deceived by the enemy into thinking that because God has given me a position to be over and to deliver you the word that I'm infallible. Oh, no. I take more responsibility than you do. That's right. Because I have to make sure that I get clean and be clear of all of my unrighteousness before I even begin to tell you what to do. The Bible says to first take the beam out of your own eye, then you can see how to take the speck out of your brothers. Amen. Right. Amen. Come on now. That's real. That's real. So I'm not going to even stand here and tell you that I don't do no wrong. Mm -hmm. I got a father mm, yeah. who's righteous and just to forgive me of my sins, cleanse me of my unrighteousness, and help me to continue to walk holy before him. If he did it for me, he'll do it for me. Amen. Amen. So now let's take a look at sin. Webster's Dictionary describes sin as a vitiated or debased state of human nature in which the self is estranged from God. The dictionary says that. And two, it tells about the transgression of the law of God. That's what sin is. So just because you say I'm saved, don't tell me you ain't transgressed God's law. Children of Israel were held captive by Pharaoh for over 400 years. Many generations were born into slavery, mm -hmm. knowing nothing but slavery. 
It was natural for them to be a slave. Therefore, the whole concept of freedom was unimaginable. And we, just like them, were born as slaves to sin. Born into it. Since it's our nature, it's only natural that we commit sin. We don't think of ourselves as being sinners, so therefore the whole thought process of salvation is unimaginable. Too many times I've heard people say, well, you know, I'm to think I don't see how they can do something like that. How could they think of something like that? It's nature to sin. Yes, right. So the whole thought process of salvation is unimaginable to most of the world today. They cannot fathom that they need salvation because they don't know they are actually living in sin because that's their nature. They were born into it. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be what? Born again. So when we see these things on television, I keep trying to tell everybody, quit talking about homosexuals. They're born into sin. Who are you supposed to target? The spirit of homosexuality. You better target that spirit. Because people have been born into sin, that's all they know. You were born into sin. That's all you knew. That's all I knew. Until God brought me out of darkness and into his marvelous light, some of the things I did, I look back on them now and go, man, you was crazy. No, I wasn't crazy. I was doing the natural thing to do, and that was to sin. But I didn't know it. I didn't accept it as a reality. So we better, we better fight this fight. Because I'm going to tell you, if you're not targeting those spirits, you're never going to win. We are never going to win this war. And we're supposed to. We are supposed to. Our, man, the, 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 the legislature is going crazy. Yes. Passing all kinds of crazy laws to allow people to do anything they want to do. Yes. That is true. What's behind it? Satan. That's right. The spirit. So we want to protest, we want to stand on our Bibles and call people this and call people that and talk about LGBT and I don't care what you call Listen, you better target that spirit that's behind it all because you're missing the mark. God's told you you have been given the power and authority over those spirits. You can press them under your feet. That's what the Word of God says. So why are we doing it? See why? Because sin is committed in a number of ways. There's the two most common sins are sins of commission and sins of omission. That's why. Now, sins of commission are those sins that are committed with the foreknowledge and without purpose of evasion. An example would be to tell an outright bold-faced lie. You know you're lying. You know you're telling a lie. Your whole purpose is to deceive somebody for whatever purpose it is that you want. You're not trying to evade. You want to totally both face out there. And then the sin of omission are those sins that are committed with foreknowledge and with the purpose of evasion. An example would be to omit telling the truth by means of deception. You'd be surprised <laughs> at the, how many people have omitted putting something on their taxes when they know they should have put something on their taxes. <laughs> now, of course, that go both ways, too. Mm -hmm. You can put something on your taxes, they ain't going to be there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Amen. A lot of people will omit telling the truth and think that that's okay. No, that's still a sin. You have to tell the truth. No matter how much it may change your outward position and situation and circumstance, you still have got to stand on 
the truth. So two biblical examples of these sins are as follows. The sin of commission is found in Genesis 37, verses 12 through 14, then 23 to 34. This is Joseph and his brothers. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to them, said to him, Here I am. Then he said to him, Please go see if all is well with your brothers and well with the flocks, and bring back the word to me. So he sent the, so he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and sent him to Sheshem. And so it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted up their eyes and looked. And there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Galilee with their camels bearing spices of balm and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there as if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then the Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. And he returned to his brothers and said, The lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether or not it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned his son for many days. Outright, bold-faced lie. Deception. You have every intent to get rid of your brother. You wanted to kill him. But because the oldest stood, said don't do it, you devised another plan. Now, as you continue to read that story and you get down to the part to where they've been reunited and they're afraid that Joseph's going to do something, what did Joseph say? That which the devil meant for bad God meant for good, that I might be alive to save Israel mm -hmm. to this very day. Mm -hmm. So God will even take things that are put against you mm -hmm. and will use those things for your betterment and for His glory. Mm -hmm. But that's a sin of commission. Anybody ever told a bold-faced lie? Mm -hmm. I have. Try to save yourself from something. Mm -hmm. You know you done done wrong and you're trying to figure out a way to get out of it instead of confessing <coughs> it. Well, if I just do this and that, I'm hoping to pray it'll nobody ever find out. Yeah, that's a sin. Mm -hmm. I don't care how saved you are, it's a sin. <laughs> then we have the sins of omission. That's Acts 1 through 10, through 10, and that's about Ananias and Sapphira. A certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, and his wife also being aware of it, and bought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down dead and breathed his last. So a great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men rose, wrapped him up, and carried him out and buried him. Now, it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what happened. Peter answered her, Tell me whether or not you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? 
Look at the feet of those who have buried your husband and are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down on his feet and breathed her last. The young man came in, found her dead, carried her out, buried her by her husband. You got something? Mm. Oh, miss. <clears throat> you had every opportunity to tell the truth, to get it out, to do what God said do. But because you omitted, because you didn't want to do what was right, you're going to keep back something for yourself. I'm going to put something away for a rainy day. Hmm. It sure rained, didn't it? Hmm. It didn't just rain, it thundered, it lightened, hmm. hell fell, hmm. and they both died. You don't have to lie to the Holy Spirit. You don't have to omit anything. Get out to God, what God is expecting of you. And you're able to get the things that you need. James 4 and 17 says, Therefore, to him to, who knows to do good and does not, to him it is sin. If you know that you're supposed to do good and you don't do it, it's sin. And I don't care how long you've been saved. I've been saved for 30 years. I've been walking with the Lord. <laughs> the bitch got my name on it. My daddy's name was on that bitch. <laughs> Care how long you've been saved? To know to do right and don't do it. Mm -hmm. That is sin. Come on. God is going to help hold you accountable to it. Sin is sin. Mm -hmm. There is no little sin or no big sin. Sin is not judged upon a scale of degree. As first John 5:17 says, all unrighteousness is sin. Mm -hmm. Anything that is not what God calls acceptable in his sight is sin. Mm -hmm. Not to lean on our own understanding or to try to figure out what is sin. It's our inherent nature. We have to fight against that nature. We have to be able to know that God has changed our lives. We no longer are slaves to sin. You sin because you want to sin. You don't sin because you have to sin. Not anymore. That's right. That's right. If you've been born again, you are now a new creature. The Bible says that old things or old processes or old way of thinking, that's been passed away. That's been put away. What do we do? We go back and dig it back, dig up. It back up. We yeah. resurrect yeah. that old life. We put it back on. That's just like taking, you know, uh, uh, some clothes you've worn for a while. They're all dirty and greasy and muddy and all torn and all the thing. And you throw it in the trash. You go buy yourself some new clothes. But then all of a sudden you start yearning for those old jeans again. You want that old stinky shirt. You go back to the trash. You dig it out. You just took a shower. Put on your smell good. And you put back on that old dirty stuff. That's exactly what it is to God. When you go back and you resurrect that old life and put that old life back on and start acting the way you used to act, doing the things you used to do. Instead of trusting God, you trust in yourself. So one way to police yourself where sin is concerned is to say, would I do that or would I say that if Jesus was physically standing in front of me? I think that's a good way to police yourself with sin is concerned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If Jesus were to walk up in this house right now physically, in his presence physically, could you say the things you normally say to your friends? Could you go the places you normally go when you think ain't nobody looking? Mm -hmm. Could you turn on those television programs that you watch? Could, you, could Jesus sit down with you and you watch him? These are rhetoricals. You can't. You don't have to answer. I'm closing my eyes again. <laughs> I don't see it. Mm. But that's what this is all about. This is how you need to start to police yourself where sin is concerned, O oh believer, in your life. Can you do it with Jesus? Mm. Mm -hmm. We got to read God's word. We got to read His Bible and pray for wisdom and knowledge, and know that God is the one who wants to direct down our pathways as we walk in righteousness and try to learn how to be free from the effects of sin because it's true 
like I said before, I think I said it last week, you know, people, you know, he's, he, he's talking about sin, he's talking about salvation. I know he's just talking about the unsaved folk. Nope. I'm talking about everybody. Because again, salvation is an ongoing process. Everybody here know how to swim? Anybody here does not know how to swim? Okay. We've been swimming. You ever been in a, in, a, in, a, in a pool or been in a body of water and found yourself kind of dyslexic in that water and was wondering if you was going to make it or not? Uh -huh. Did that stop you from going back in the water? No. You went back in the water anyway. Mm -hmm. See, so just because you've been saved don't mean you don't go back to that thing. So it doesn't mean you don't still need salvation because you're going to go back in that water and they'll tell, tell me it's not going to be another time. You're going to find yourself in a position where, ooh, we. I've served, uh, I, I think there's a, I can't remember her name, but she's a surfer. And a shark took her so arm. Yes. Her arm is gone. Now, me? <laughs> I don't even want to think, I don't even want to get in the bathtub. <laughs> I, I'm a shower man for the rest of my life. I don't want to stand out. If it's more than two inches of water, I got a problem. But this woman still surfs today. And good at it. And good at it. Yep. Got one arm. Mm -hmm. Good at it. Did not allow that opportunity to wreck her life. Because she still had a job to do. And that's what happens with us a lot of time believers. That sometimes when we fall, we don't want to get back up and keep on going. Because we think that we have done something so dastardly that God could never forgive us. And that's not the truth. God wants to, He is able to forgive you of all of your sins and all of your unrighteousness. You gotta just get back up and keep on going. But you have to realize that salvation is continual. It doesn't stop just the first time you get saved. Because you're going to fall. Mm -hmm. You're going to sin. God knew it. That's why he put the word in his, his uh, uh, scriptures in his word that says that he is just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of your unrighteousness when you confess your faults to him. Mm -hmm. He didn't say if, he said when. Mm -hmm. Knowing that it's going to happen. Yep. So we praise God today for salvation. Jesus only died once for all. He doesn't have to continue to die, but that blood is still potent today to continue to guard you, guide you, govern you in the way you should live, and to continue to cleanse you of your unrighteousness. Because you're going to get dirty. Yeah. And all he wants to do is to continue to clean you up. As a child, you know, we used to go outside, man, we come back in. I remember my children. <laughs> One time, they were all, the I got four boys. The boys was out, I mean, they was just having a ball, doing all kinds of stuff. Came back in and, and, and they, they all you know, come in, take a bath. Mm -hmm. To the bath, and she, she caught me into the bathroom. I looked at the tub, man, it was half inch dirt. <laughs> <laughs> what was what they you, doing? What <laughs> what they <laughs> Look at all the dirt, but they were clean. What happened the next week? Went right back out. Got dirty again. But the water always ran with cleansing. That's what God's blood wants to do for you. No matter how dirty you get, God has a blood that can continue to cleanse you from your unrighteousness. That's what salvation is all about. It's continual. Yes. And it will never stop. Amen? Amen. God wants you to keep on keeping on with him. Realize what he has in store for you. I'm going to continue with salvation because I want you to, any questions that you have, I want you answered about salvation. Because I get a lot of people think it's because I'm saved. I don't need salvation no more. Oh, yes, you do. Every day. All day. Amen. Amen. Amen.